Oh, that's... Every time. Wait for right that. The now we're good, and Perfect. you should be seeing us out in cyberspace. Uh, Earl with the newspaper. Tabor with the city. Thanks for having me, Earl, as always. Uh, our vice mayor here to explain to you everything that they talked about last night. We're going to go over some of those things and, and uh, share with you. And I tell you what, when it started off, it's thinking th they're not going to have a regular meeting. This is a public meeting because there's so many people that had uh, different issues to talk about. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a busy evening. And uh, so, Taylor, I guess we'll start right off with that. Our favorite city activist citizen. Rita Isaacs. This is Isaacs. Got to see Rita again. So Rita came and what she talked to you about. So Rita basically was upset about the Air Museum director leaving, which a lot of us are. That was a very unfortunate situation and I uh, wish it could have worked out differently. Um, but, you know, a lot of people that got to work with uh, um, with our previous Air Museum director had a really good experience, myself included in that. He was a very progressive um, guy, had a very, you know, awesome vision of what he wanted to accomplish out there. So completely unfortunate that it worked out the way it did. Um, but she wondered why we voted down the agenda items in the previous meeting um, for the Air Museum. So to give everybody a recap on that, um, at the previous meeting, they had basically brought up three agenda items from the Air Museum. One was the purchase of a, a, a $2,500 toolbox to be used um, inside the facility um, for not only training, um, but uh, maintenance purposes. The other was the roof, and the other was new lighting, LED lighting throughout the facility. Um, so what we had told um, the previous director in that meeting was that we needed to fix the roof before we did any of the other stuff because it only makes sense, you know, you don't want to put a nice toolbox in there and then have the roof leak and ruin it all over again or ruin the lighting. Um, so, and we'll talk about this later in this video today, um, but we did finally approve the roof later on in the meeting. Um, so I'm sure that we'll be getting more quotes and pursuing that lighting next. Um, and then we'll see on the toolbox, my understanding is that they have received enough um, um, donations from the community. So thank you to everybody that donated that money to go ahead and get that. So they'll probably see that through as well. So uh, another thing that Rita said is the reason she hasn't been present as many of the meetings is she serves on a board that has their meetings at the same time. She actually said that she's planning on resigning from that board just so she can start coming back to these meetings. So um, Rita, it's always fantastic having you there. Um, I love your input and love how uh, connected you are to the community. So I appreciated your time last night. Um, the next one in the items from Citizens was Nancy Parsons. Um, unfortunately, we had a, uh, a special meeting between the MAM Foundation and the City of Liberal on Friday because of the vacancy of the Air Museum Director uh, position. We wanted to make sure and kind of communicate with them and get back on track as quickly as possible. Um, Nancy's husband, Don, unfortunately suffered a mini stroke during that meeting. Um, and so Nancy came to just thank us about how um, the situation around Don's uh, uh, mini stroke was handled. Um, fortunately for us, um, one of our uh, fire department um, director heads, um, Skeedy, was there and he handled it incredibly well um, and, and comforted Don right off the bat, made sure that he had excellent care. Um, ambulance came down very quickly. They got them all taken care of. My understanding now is he's good to go, but thoughts and prayers are still with you, Don. Um, hope you get a full recovery from that. Frank Friesen was the next one. Always love getting to see Frank. He was asking questions about um, where we were at with the overall flooding solution on re, uh, redoing all of the infrastructure here in town um, so that we don't have any neighborhoods that flood. This has been a highly, uh, you know, highly talked about um, thing that's on, you know, all of our uh, minds right now. Fortunately enough, Cal said that in the next meeting, um, Earl's Engineering should be presenting the overall drainage uh, improve, improvement plan for the city. So hopefully, if the community likes it, if we like it as commissioners, and we feel like it's a solid plan, we'll be able to finally get started on that before storm season really kicks in. Um, but Frank, one of the biggest questions he had is, he was wanting to know, A, what the, the situation was with uh, the grant that we're going to be getting from FEMA, um, which Cal informed him that... Uh, um, we've been working with them. Um, we should be in the final stages of the approval process, but we haven't received the money yet. Um, and then basically, Frank also wanted to know, could we go ahead and dig some of the retention ponds deeper to try to pre-prepare for some of these uh, storms that may be coming through? Um, and unfortunately, we can't. And Cal, I felt like, gave a very good explanation as to why, was that if we go ahead and do anything now, we'll lose the opportunity for the grant because they'll basically say, well, you already had the money to start tearing into it. You didn't need our grant money to finish the project. So... The second we get the, the plan presented to us and get the FEMA money rolling in, we're, we're going to get everything torn up and get to, get liberal to where we don't have the flooding issues. Um, the last person in the items from Citizens was Karen Wilson. She's uh, been pretty active and coming to quite a few of the meetings. Um, she wanted to know if something could be done about a lot of the empty businesses throughout Liberal and was inquiring to question about JDC and what we had coming into the area. Um, I completely understand her concern because I know... The, the main thing that always bothers me when looking through Liberal, and it's been this way for years, 
is how many vacancies there are on like Main Street, you know, just especially like down where we're at right here. Um, on both sides of the road, there's quite a few vacancies, stuff like that. So um, one thing we informed her is we do have a couple businesses looking at coming in right now. Um, one of them that could possibly come in um, is a major manufacturing company. So hopefully things will work out and we can see some positive progress in that direction. But, um, you know, we're a very JEDC aggressive driven commission. So I'd like to think that we're going to see a lot of flourishing of our local economy over the next four years because we are fighting tooth and nail to try to get things in and, and all the directors um, that, that work inside of JADC at the city are doing the same thing. So hopefully that'll start paying off soon. I know one thing, and she brought this up, she said, when are we gonna get things besides hotels and restaurants? I will tell you, when I was running for office, I thought the same thing. You know, I thought, why are we just getting all these hotels and restaurants? What's the purpose of this? There is a grand purpose to it, you know, because a lot of times when you can't have the pull to get the major manufacturing and distributing logistical companies and things like that in, sometimes you have to put the restaurants, hotels, and, and smaller retail stores in just to be able to get um, a lot of the, the major companies to even look at your um, community. So hopefully we'll start to see a lot more on that front. She also asked us if we could be extra, extra physically conservative. Um, because, you know, she, she wanted to point out that a lot of people are very strapped on cash right now due to some of the different taxing entities. Um, so we assured her we will try to be as conservative as humanly possible. Um, Robert DeLeon, thanks for joining us, man. Bring cruising through Light Park back. You know, man, I, um, I want to say that I inquired about that, like, right after getting into office. And I highly doubt that they'll ever make it to where you can actually drive all the way through the park again. But trust me when I say I, I had a lot of fond memories um, back when we had stogies across the road. Um, over there by where Jack's Kitchen is. I used to go buy cigars and sit in the back of my truck with friends and we'd cruise around there and smoke cigars and stuff and had a great time. Um, but I think there was quite a few reasons why they stopped doing that. So I'll tell you what, before the next video Earl and I do next week, I'll try to have a definitive explanation as to why they stopped allowing that. Um, and then if there is a, a possibility in the future that they may change it, but I, I kind of doubt. And they actually removed part of the road when they put in the new parking lot for the the new swim park and so there's no way unless you just want to drive through the parking lot of the yeah. swimming pool i don't see that they're ever going to have that back in there uh but that doesn't mean that there can't be new locations new cruising areas and uh, all of that you know back when i was a kid we used to cruise from what we called c plus to c plus but mm -hmm. there was a convenience store on the south side of town and the convenience store on the north side of town and we would go uh cruising uh, there. So the cruising destinations well, do change over time. I know one thing that cracked me up is there was a little deal on Facebook going around about bringing back the uh, the cruising in Light Park. And, uh, and here it is. Um, it basically had like a Trump style hat. Make Light Park cruisable again. Thought that was hilarious. <laughs> so um, I definitely, I appreciate people that that want to see that. And like Earl said, hopefully we'll come up with, with something else that the community can use to that endeavor. I would like to say to Don uh, Parsons out there, or anyone else who may come to a city commission meeting, don't let it get to where you're ready to have a stroke. Don't 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 get upset. Don't 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 get that. No matter what happens. Well, uh, and I think with Don, they uh, they said because he had told Skeety that he'd had a major change in his medication. So I think it was just unfortunate timing. Yeah, and um, I think the room was warm. It with was all those people and, yeah, and that was. and that also probably had an effect. But Don, we're rooting for you. Yes, we know we you're going to be back kicking and feisty as ever. So uh, we look forward to. To a quick recovery. So that was one, two, three, four different citizens. And I know that that's been a, a, a very sought after relationship that the commission has been mm -hmm. going for was to have people come and you're coming. And, yep. and so Love that's it. been good to see. Keep it up. Now, how about uh, IRB bonds? These are bonds that allow companies to uh, have a little bit of a a tax incentive to build, and we've had some that have already built some great things, yep. and they were coming through, and they bought their own bonds. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what that was last night? So it's uh, it's known as Ordinance Number 4499. Um, Garth from Gilmore and Bell um, came down to present to us. Um, the total amount of the IRB is for um, $7,895,430, um, and it's for VAS Hotels, which is who owns the new hotel out there on 54 with the Conference Center. Um, the cool thing about this is there's absolutely no financial repercussions for the city of Liberal. W believe it or not, the hotel that we issued the IRBs to has already bought those IRBs. So there's absolutely no chance of financial fallback on the city. Um, this was just a, a way of working with them as an incentive to help get their costs down on building materials um, and things like that to help them have an incentive to want to come here. Which one thing I, I stress people to understand is you want conference centers. 
Um, one thing that blew my mind when I was up in Topeka for training with uh, um, the League of Municipalities was they had like nine conference centers in this hotel. And I asked one of the managers on staff, I was like, how often do you guys have events here? Every single day. I was like, holy crap. Think about how many people that brings to town that buy gas, buy food, stay in that hotel, things like that. So hopefully having more conference centers with these hotels in town will be an incentive to get more people to have conferences here. Um, I know a lot of that legwork will be on some of the committees in town to really aggressively try to pursue that, but it should pan out into being some good sales tax dollars. Um, basically, that was the, the fat and skinny of it on that. It passed 4-0. Um, they also, my understanding was they get a 10-year property tax abatement. It's actually very standard. That's actually very short. A lot of people get much longer abatements than that. And that will only, to my understanding, affect the hotel bed tax dollar collection with them. So it should end up, um, you know, being something that there's still a revenue generator for the city. Um, and this was just, you know, kind of a housekeeping item that we needed to prove it to make sure that they could go ahead and get open. And that area of town is seeing some other growth. There's another motel development going on uh, in that area. So a lot of, a lot of things happening in, in that growth area of that, of, of the uh, accommodations industry. So mm -hmm. we're, we're definitely seeing ourselves as a community catching up in the accommodations industry. You also had the North Liberal Improvement Project. Indeed. Yeah. So basically, and this was broke down into two things. So um, we had a first reading of ordinance number 4,500 and then also approval of documents. Um, basically, this will come back up in next meeting, so I highly encourage anybody um, that's interested in this to come to the next meeting and, and be able to catch the rest of it. Um, but basically, with the, uh, the improvement projects up there, um, phase one required that we voted, had voting action to move it forward, and then now there'll be a public hearing for phase two. Um, so, and let me pull it up. I brought, that's the agenda. Nice and thick. I think this agenda was uh, 200 and like 80 something pages, which is just fantastic. Um, but let double, me pull Double-sided. Oh, yeah, yeah. Double-sided pages. It, it's <laughs> glorious. Um, and weirdly enough, like, these are actually much easier to go through electronically, but I've started requesting them in paper just because of these meetings um, because sometimes trying to scroll through and find it electronically takes much, much longer than it does to do it here. Okay, so a lot of it is going to be um, sewer improvements. Okay, street improvements, Centennial Boulevard. Um, that was one of them that has the final cost for everything on it. Um, and then the assessment role certification. So essentially, if I tried to break this down and actually explain everything, I think even I would get confused by it. But basically, there's quite a few improvements that are happening in the north side of Liberal. So just to break down like the main headlines, you have North Pinnacle addition to the city of Liberal, um, Century Heights addition to the city of Liberal. Um, they actually have two of those. Um, and then also Millennium First addition to the city of Liberal. Um, we have multiple resolutions, 2235, 2236. Um, water and sewer improvements um, up by Centennial and US 83 and street improvements on Centennial Boulevard. So it, it's quite a comprehensive project. Um, you guys will, like I said, get to hear a lot more about it in next meeting because we'll have a public hearing about it. Um, but basically, we just needed to vote on it to be, move it forward. That way we could even have a public hearing. Now, the first thing that he said there, I want to make sure that you caught it because he said there's a distinct advantage to words on the printed pa paper. Just want to make sure you understand <laughs> that there's an advantage to words being on printed paper. Uh, no, it's good to have some things printed out where you can follow back through it. And uh, yeah. uh, a lot of things happening up north. The Pinnacle Edition, we all know. Yeah. That's where I'm the excited. new old Chicago and other things are going to be going up in in uh, the north side of Tucker right there. Yeah. So we're all ready. On I can't wait till they break ground on the, the actual mall part of that, the outlet mall. I can't wait to, to see what that's going to look like because kind of have a vision of it in my mind of what it's going to look like. Some Something similar like Garden City's style of outlet mall out there, um, or like in Wichita, a lot of their newer outlet malls on the west side of town. Uh, but I just can't wait to kind of see like, you know, what's it going to be? How big is it going to be? How big are the individual stores going to be? Because a lot of that's going to pertain to who we can get in to occupy those spaces. And I have a feeling Pinnacle's very aggressive. They'll probably be able to fill every single one of those spots by the time it's done. And we're going to be waiting on Pinnacles and Needles for that to happen. So, uh, but we know it's going to happen. We know some of the people that are local that are involved with it and yep. uh, they're committed to the community and they're committed to the growth. So it's going to be exciting to see that. Now, uh, environmental and vehicle abatements, resolution 2279. Indeed. You know, these resolutions, while necessary and while I always support them, always kind of frustrate me because you never want the city to have to impede on people's private property. But for the love of God, don't let it get this bad. 
You know, looking at some of these pictures, I can absolutely understand the necessity um, for us to go in and clean this stuff up because when we're trying to get people and businesses to move in here, they don't want to see, you know, a lot of residences look like this. And just to like give you an idea, and I'll try to like cover, um, I'll try to cover the address because I'm not trying to call this person specifically out. Let's see if I can do it like this. <laughs> but like this kind of stuff, um, we're right there. We're like on the property. There's just like massive amounts of junk and things like that. So what this does is anytime that the city deems it um, unsafe um, to have that amount of crap around your house and on your property, then basically they notify the people that own the home, um, tell them that they need to clean it up completely, you know, free of charge at that point. And then if they do not respond to that, then basically they we pass an ordinance like this, which gives our city personnel the, the right basically to go in and clean that up for them and then it's billed to them. So it's at no cost to the city, even though we cover the initial cost of paying the personnel to go do it, and then we're recompensated by the property owners. So I know some people think that this is unfair when things like this happen. Don't let your property get to that point and it won't happen um, is the best way that I know how to put it because I know a lot of people that, that come through different parts of town are like, mm, you know, kind of looking around like, man, I wouldn't want to live there. You don't want any part of town to feel like that because that heavily influences the appraisal values and the home values in those parts of town. So we approved that 4-0. Um, it was just a matter of kind of getting some of the vehicles that are, you know, junked out, sitting there missing all their components, moved out of there. And a lot of them, you know, you got propane tanks and stuff like that just laying around. Um, so it's, it's a safety and environmental issue. Got it done, so hopefully we'll get everything cleaned up. Well, and you don't buy a house expecting someone two doors down to have five vehicles in parts all around and yep. and the danger of that, but also the runoff. I mean, mm -hmm. you've got oil and all of that, and that stuff is going to wash down and and we all then have the cost of all of that. So Indeed. it's 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 not just a matter of wanting to look nice, although I'm sure Larry Kuchel out there who <laughs> was very strong on on uh, the appearance of the town would would be in favor of these kind of things. It's it's also about safety and mm -hmm. and the the added expense we all have if if these things uh, just continue to deteriorate in our city. We don't we don't that's not what we want to be known for. Yeah. We want to respect everyone's individual rights to uh, have your property and, and keep it, maintain it however you, you choose to a certain point where it becomes a hazard to everyone else or an eyesore that's just beyond the pale. Yeah. And uh, so uh, those are unnecessary evils that come with well, And some of them too property. were like, you know, trees that were broken down in the ice storm way back when that were still there. Which like we all had an opportunity to collect them all up and have yeah. them hauled off in the city. And the county all joined Came together, together yeah. to get that cleaned up. So there was an opportunity to get it cleaned up, and, and it's unfortunate, but it's it's probably a necessary evil. Indeed. How about the uh, uh, aircraft firefighting training? So once again, Skeety was the one that presented this. Um, awesome guy. Basically, uh, this is done through uh, the University of Kansas, uh, so KU Fire and Rescue Training Institute. Um, this is a, I believe he said every three years we require this training, especially because the airport's doing so well. We want to make sure that we have qualified staff to handle any kind of events that happen out there. Um, basically, between all of the expenses, it's going to come out to $11,000. Um, that was approved 4-0. It's really one of those where you kind of have to do things like this to make sure that our, our emergency management services are properly prepared for any kind of situation that could come across the table. I don't know the exact date, but I know that the airport soon is actually doing like a full emergency training drill where um, I don't know if they'll be training for like, okay, an aircraft just crash landed on the runway, um, that kind of situation or an active shooter at the airport situation. But I do know that uh, Debbie Gitsky, which is our airport manager out there, awesome lady, um, she was informing me last night that we do have that training coming up. So I love getting to see all of our police officers and fire department officials um, and EMS officials get this amount of training because the more prepared you are uh, for these kind of situations, the better we'll handle them when they occur. Hopefully they never occur, but you wanna be prepared. That way if they do, you're not sitting there wondering what the heck to do. So um, that one was approved for O. And then I believe, nope, nope, that was it for the fire department. Yep. And when you hear uh, Taylor talking about 4-0, just so you know, uh, Commissioner Warren wasn't able to make it last night, so there were only four commissioners at the meeting. Indeed. And uh, so that's why you hear the, the 4-0. And there's a lot of things going on at our Kalen. Yes. I got to tell you, I'm really excited because I've always utilized our Kalen. Um, carp fishing-wise, one of the greatest ponds you could ever go to. Um, and what I love is, you know, they, they did all the dam reinforcement and fixing of the ponds. You know, I think they're still undergoing some of that. 
Um, but they're also going to be receiving the playground equipment um, that USD 480 was kind enough to gift over to us. So thank you very much to the school board and all of the, uh, all of the personnel out at 480. That was very generous. That will be very well utilized out there. Um, but what this was about is, I guess they went out and they were kind of doing an inspection on increasing some of the, the amperage that was going to some of the RV sites and found out, holy crap, none of it's within code. All of it needs redone. A lot of it didn't have anything to use properly. Um, and I did bring a diagram that shows everything. So this is what was presented to us. And as you can see, this looks like uh, uh, John Madden showing a play-by-play -play on NFL Monday Night Football. Um, but basically what all of these are is these are all the different uh, electrical lines that are running through there. Um, so they're going to be doing a massive improvement and getting all of those back up into code because our Kalen's getting enough improvements. We're coming up on uh, you know the touristy time of the year where it's very nice out there. And, and I want to see all those spots filled all the time. You know, I hope people are going to be able to enjoy our Kalen enough that they'll stay for a long tenure out there in their RVs. Um, so basically, the, uh, the total dollar amount um, of all of the improvements to get everything good to go, we're actually going to be able to do this in-house. So, you know, you have to have a master electrician um, involved in these projects to be able to get them certified um, through the, the fire marshal and everything like that. Nice thing is... We're going to have a master electrician oversee our guys doing it and exponentially save on the cost to get the project done while also making sure that we're meeting the adequate standards. Um, I want to say that the total purchase price on this one um, was $2,940. No, you know what? I'm going to go with $15,000 <laughs> because I want to say, because I wrote $15,000 in my notes, but I'm looking at this. They must have had a couple that built up to that amount. Um, because I wrote 15000 in the notes. So it'll upgrade all of our existing electrical out there while bringing in new features and getting everything fully into compliance. Now let's go with the 15000 We're going to go with the 15000 And if it comes in below that, great. But let's yeah. <laughs> see if we go But we don't, we don't want to go on the low end and find out, you know, there's 2900 that was 15000 Yeah, that was 15000 Okay, so now we've got a uh, few things going on with the rec department. Indeed, and Matt Quint, man, I love that guy to death. He has done an excellent job of, of really kind of unifying um, everything with our recreational department and getting everybody really in the community really excited about uh, getting involved in Kids, Inc. and all these other activities. So um, last year in the flood that we had, a ton of equipment was damaged because one of the, the places that they stored it had a massive leak and it flooded all of it and just ruined it. Um, so he had two different things on here. Um, one of them was, and, and the kind of equipment we're talking about is like junior catcher gear, um, girls catcher gear, varsity catcher gear, youth catcher gear, youth catcher mitts, um, all sorts of different kind of catcher mitts, all these things, game balls, flag football sideline markers, batting tees, all the stuff that was damaged in that flood. And there's like a very long list of it. Um, but basically the total amount of the expenditure was $2,690.93. Um, and that will get our recreation departments to have all of the new equipment that they need to be able to fully function throughout the summer. So good stuff. Um, next with Matt Quint in the Liberal Recreation Department was baseball field improvements at the National B Family Sports Complex. And haven't we all been waiting to see some of that? Um, because I know a lot of people in the community were never happy with those fields out there. So it's nice that, uh, that we have a director that's starting to really dig in and figure out how we can fix it and make the community like the fields more. Um, so a couple things that, that they're going to be doing out there. We're going to be getting uh, digital scoreboards, which you have to understand. One thing that Matt, I'd never heard of this, but that Matt really hammered on, these scoreboards will have a pitch counter because I guess um, the high school um, recreation league is starting to really hammer down on. They do not want any pitchers to exceed 100 pitches per game. Um, so all of these will be digital billboards. Um, they'll have you know the time, all the score count, all of the different counts you'd expect, plus a pitch counter um, for the safety of the kids to make sure that we're not overextending any of the players. Um, and it also just gives you a lot better feel to have a digital scoreboard. That's kind of a necessary thing in today's world, in my opinion. Um, the amount of that was $30,404.59, and that will be funded from streets, drainage, and other capital improvement portions of the one cent sales tax. Um, if you're asking yourself why it would come from that fund, um, the other capital improvements portion, um, the baseball fields were a big part of the, the idea and mindset behind one cent sales tax, so that's why that money was able to be allocated for that. Um, the old last thing we had from the rec department is, they're going to be fixing the dugouts, which I know that's been a really principal area of concern for a lot of people. They say it's like a sweat house down there. You know, it just gets no air. It floods all the time, all those different issues. Um, so they're going to be redoing both dugouts, doing new electrical wiring, digging them up higher so they don't flood, figuring out better ventilation in them. Um, now, they didn't have an exact dollar amount, but they were very confident that we could do both dugouts without exceeding $20,000 um, from the same streets, drainage, and other capital improvements portion of one cent sales tax. So exciting things. I'm, I'm ready to see these ball fields get underway and see them being utilized all the time. And just to uh, clarify, Keisha that oversees 
the Kansas High School Athletic Association, they changed the rule last year. So the pitch count is a big deal yep. because if you pitch, I think the number is right around uh, 30 pitches and you come out, then you can still play the next game. But if you exceed that, then you got to set out a couple of days. Then there's another pitch count that could get you setting out three or four days. And then there's a pitch count to get you out for a full week. So coaches need to know how many pitches their players have yeah. so they can plan accordingly. And the visitor coach needs to know the same thing. Absolutely. So the pitch count is now part of the game. And uh, having that on the scoreboard is, is, is going to be helpful to all those concerned. Another thing is um, uh, Little League also – Keeping track of how many pitches your little your your younger players have uh, is also a nice tool, and um, those scoreboards have been out there. They're 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 old and and they're you replace the bulbs. I mean they're the bulb type, yeah. and and so if a bulb goes out, you know you just change the six to a five. Yeah. So uh, uh, and and there's there's cost of that. So these these digital boards are going to be a much better fan friendly, uh, lower maintenance kind of a deal for everybody so it's going to be a good a good deal plus well, we want to be ready to host tournaments yes because and that's that where was the money's at yeah and that was really matt really hammered in on that is that we want to host softball tournaments baseball tournaments um you know soccer basketball everything because that all brings people in the community i mean he went as far as to say thumb wrestling tournaments dodgeball anything we can do to get people in so love his mentality another thing to remember is on these uh these scoreboards they come with excellent warranties and they're also very very easily fixed so if we have a part of it go out, it's literally just pulling that LED panel out and snap, snapping a new one in. And Matt even explained that most of the time when these go out, the company just sends you a brand new one free of charge because you bought the scoreboard. I can tell you, I thought for three scoreboards, that was cheap because we have uh, businesses contact us all the time asking about commercial displays. One commercial display for your business can cost $50,000 that quick. So I thought scoreboards would be in that same ballpark. Um, so I was actually pretty impressed that we could get three for that amount. Let me ask you this, uh, on the, the lower dollar deal, the replacement of some of the equipment, $2,800 or somewhere around there, uh, was that equipment out at the new fields? Did they mention the flooding? Was what the flooding happened out at the uh, the new softball fields? I'm sure the flooding didn't happen in uh, Blue Bonnet Park. It says that these items will replace damaged gear that was ruined in the 2017 flood at the 8th Street Complex. Okay, so no. that's the 8th Street Complex. That's what I thought. <coughs> I just wanted you all to hear that, to know that this was damage caused because of the location of the softball fields. And that's another problem, mm -hmm. but I know Earl's Engineering is working on a bunch of yep. ways to alleviate flooding. Well, we have them on so many projects right now, it's not even funny. So not only are they looking at overall drainage in Liberal, but also how to fix the ball fields, and then also helping us on 2nd Street, and every other street project that we're on, and all the water line improvements. <laughs> so we got, we got them busy right now. So just... So, you know, this was a, a problem that happened last summer during the flooding for ball fields that were built in a floodplain. Yep. But that's Hello, Shell. How are you this afternoon? Thanks for joining us. They can work on that. Uh, okay, so you also appointed someone. Yes, we did. I think you put that off before, but you appointed someone to the uh, housing board. Yeah, and I'm sure that uh, uh, Barbara, who runs the, uh, the Liberal Housing Authority, was probably pretty relieved that we were able to just get this one done and sit down at the table. Um, so we appointed Mickey Durbin. Um, is going to serve a, I believe, a four-year term. Hopefully I'm not incorrect on that. It's either going to be two or four. Um, but I thought she was an excellent fit for it, um, and she was who the board recommended, so we went ahead and just appointed her right on up there. Um, and I believe that uh, they'll, we'll probably be hearing more from the Liberal Housing Authority soon um, because I did notice on the first sheet um, that they also had another vacancy. Uh, Verna Van Dodge completed her four-year term on the board and resigned. So she did her time, went ahead and got out of there, so they'll probably need somebody else as well. Hello, you two. Um, have you seen the two new Best Western now? It's nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I actually thought that looked really good. And there's been quite a few businesses that have been changed in town. You know, the Holiday Inn is now the Best Western. Um, First National Bank is now Equity Bank. And I thought both transitions of those looked quite well. Um, you could tell on the, the First National Bank that they were like, all right, we got to make the signs big enough to cover the old emblems. <laughs> um, but I know I bank with First National. I was exceedingly happy with how well that transition was. And I know that uh, the Best Western being there where the old Holiday Inn Express was, I think that will work out great. It's one of the only hotels in that area. And we're getting, just so that you know, we're getting a new Holiday Inn Express uh, being built uh, on the east side, on East 54. Um, and uh, so 
the reason that they had to transition the other one at Best Western and uh, maintain certain standards. And if mm -hmm. you remember, we used to have a Best Western on 54, the La Fonda, yep. and then it became a budget host. So this gets Best Western back in town, and it gets uh, the, the owners being building a new uh, Holiday Inn Express because they also have standards, and if yep. you don't spend – an, a, a, an atrocious amount of money every few years to basically remodel everything. Then you start looking at it saying, I'll just build a new one for that and yep. rebrand this one. So we got a great Best Western Inn and Suites now, yep. and we're going to have a brand new Holiday Inn Express. Which is awesome. And uh, you talked about this a little bit, but you're going to want to share where the money comes from because this is a shared cost deal, the Mid-America Air Museum roof. Ah, we are finally getting a new roof on the Air Museum. This has been a long time coming. I know that uh, when I was doing the Drone Academy and Steve Leet and I would be out there pretty late night preparing for events, when the wind would get going 20, 30 miles an hour, I felt like the roof was literally going to fly off of that complex. Um, and I remember there being like a corner that I think was previously repaired, but uh, there was a corner where you could actually see the sky when it got windy enough. So this has been needing to be done for a long time. It's an air museum. Right? Yes. No, no, it was there for yeah, we just opened the roof up. Um, no, so basically, um, and to break this down in the easiest way to understand, um, the MAM Foundation, um, they were able to get $50,000 in grants to use towards this roof. So thank you very much for all the hard work on the MAM Foundation. That is a fantastic group of people, and they bust their butts to make sure that that air museum is everything that it can be. So thank you very much for that donation on there. Um, and then also, um, the, the previous improvement to fix that corner that kept flopping up uh, was $20,604. So... The, the initial quote from Webcom, um, which is the, uh, the company that's going to be doing the roof now, was $215,454. Um, so minus the $20,604 and the $50,000 grant from MAM, um, we're looking at only spending $144,850 out of the tourism um, fund here in town to be able to get that fixed up out there. So another big thank you not only to the MAM Foundation for securing that grant, um, but to the, the Liberal Tourism um, Convention and Visitors Bureau, thank you so much for being easy to work with on this and, and for extending out a helping hand on us getting this roof done. I, I know I had a previous comment. I think that was either in the paper or on an online article that I caught some crap over about saying that the Air Museum is a revenue generator. Okay, if you look at the Air Museum itself, no. It, it, it's like the swimming pool and every other public service. It just bleeds money, right? But what the Air Museum does is it brings in a ton of people from out of town that buy gas here, buy food here, stay in a hotel, um, you know, buy uh, fuel out at the airport, things like that. So to me, the Air Museum is a very, very important entity here in town. And it's really only one of like five tourist things that we have here. So we really got to embrace that and try to make it everything it can be. So getting the roof done, major part of that. Um, I feel like that things need to be redone for 10 years. And the nicest thing is, is that between last meeting and this meeting, um, the cost not only went down from the company that, that gave us the quote, but we went from a 10 year to a 20 year warranty. So that thing is going to be taken care of for a long time. So very exciting stuff. I tickled pink that we finally got that thing through. And I would imagine now in the upcoming meetings, probably probably three meetings away, you'll hear us talking about the lighting, getting a new LED lighting in the Air Museum, um, because that's going to save a fortune and make it you know look much more updated and new. Um, and then we'll look at any other expenditures that they have planned. So two things to help you. Uh, the, ter the transient tax is the uh, fund that they talked about when they say the uh, tourism fund, that's a transient tax. And how that's paid is anyone who stays the night in a motel pays a little piece to the transient tax. So it's not a part of property tax. It's not a part of sales tax. It's a completely separate tax, yep. only paid by those who spend the night here. And that's the tourism side of it. Yep. So that money is used to advocate for tourism. And that's where this additional $140,000 or so is coming from to pay for the roof. It's not coming from any local tax collection, only from people who spend the night. Now, the other thing is, when he talks about the uh, money being made at the Air Museum, what you're talking about is what's called the economic impact yes. of the museum. It has an economic impact on the community. It benefits the restaurants. It benefits the shopping. It benefits the gas stations. It benefits the motels. Anyone who comes and stays here to go to that or travels in, think about when... Uh, even at the end of the year, they're going to have a lot of tourists from schools. So those schools are going to come in, and they're going to come watch that. And then they're going to take 30 or 40 kids to one of the restaurants, and they're going to feed those kids. That's the economic impact yes. side of it that you don't see in the ticket sale, but you see in the benefit to the community yep. by having things like that. And I believe that number is usually around, depending on the community and the type of event that it is, but it's somewhere around 75 to $200 yep. per person. 
And so you start to find out how many people you brought in and take it times your factorial of the economic impact and you find out what exactly your uh, tourist attraction provides to the community. So just a clarification on where the money is coming from is yep. from the transient tax, which only is collected at hotels by people who stay the night here, and the economic impact of of something like the Air Museum, Dorothy's House, the Land of Oz, Coronado Baker Museum, Arts, Baker Coronado, Arts. all of those things have an economic impact yep. on the community. Well, and real quick too, since you said Baker Arts, big shout out to Tony and all the personnel down there at the Baker Arts Center for bringing in the butterfly and stingray exhibit. That was awesome. Um, my daughter, I think, went two or three yeah. times. But I know every time we went, there was a lot of people there. We always saw school buses from other communities leaving there. You know, those kind of events um, that these nonprofits do are so valuable to a community like ours because of what Earl just said. Um, you know, they, they bring in, um, you know, that, that school bus, it's full of 40, 50 kids. They go eat at pizza or they go eat at one of our local restaurants, which generates more tax uh, revenue. So all good stuff. And I just love getting to see everything that Baker Arts, uh, the, the MAM Foundation, the Air Museum, Coronado Museum, and the, uh, the Land of Oz, everything they're doing. I'm glad that we don't have to buy a new sign. Yeah. You know, because when I saw that, I was like, oh. That's going to have to be replaced, but it ended up only denting the one uh, pole really well, bad on it. It knocked out a panel on the other side. Oh, I didn't see uh, that. But hopefully that, that the guy who hit that sign has good car insurance because uh, we're going to have to get that fixed. We are already talking about repainting that and working with the, the technical school and uh, having that uh, repainted as it was. But um, now we've got some other work to do on that sign. Absolutely. If you didn't know, if you haven't watched, been following the news, the, the sign at the Coronado Museum out on Highway 54 got hit by a vehicle. Pretty and, hard. Um, the, the, the driver was taken into custody and uh, a DUI, I believe. But uh, in any event, um, we'll get the sign fixed. Yep. And uh, I thought and the crazy thing is that is like dense, dense iron. And it, <laughs> to dent that with a fiberglass-made vehicle takes skill. And that, that man had it. Well, and from, from the report we got... They were coming on 54 and tried to turn down the Yellow Brick Road, and, and that's where they ended up. Denied. So, that, so if you can't make that turn, you're hauling it. Yes, because that, that is a very wide intersection right there. I mean, you would think you could even take that at a rolling 30. <laughs> so he must have been cruising on down the road right there. So, we, the, you know, that's not – that when, when we talk about come stroll down the Yellow Brick Road, that's not what we're <laughs> talking about right there, okay? But uh, – in any event, some great things happening even yeah. in the tourists, and we're just coming up on the tourist season, so things are going to get really heated up, so it's good to get that new roof on there, get some improvements inside with the lighting. Yep. It's going to be great. Okay, Sweet. now we talked a little bit about Earl's Engineering's working all over town right now. Uh, one of the areas is uh, the corner at 54 and Clay Street. Yes, indeed. And this is an interesting one because basically anything that's taking place with those roads uh, has to go through KDOT. And a lot of times whenever you're working with an independent contractor, which is what Rolls Engineering is, and a state or federal level entity like KDOT, um, you have to have um, basically agreements that explain the scope of work, explain a lot of things about what the expectations from the contractor are, how they'll integrate in with KDOT and everything like that. Um, so basically, Cal did a good job of explaining this item. Um, but basically, let me pick up the Bible here. Um, basically what it was is that... Uh, Construction observation is estimated to be hourly with an upper limit of $169,886.37. Um, so basically, the city will be billed on a monthly basis based on the work completed to date. Um, and, and really, you're not going to find any lower cost than that with any engineering firm. It's just these things, to get them done right, they cost money. Hello, Jackie. How are you this afternoon? And the thing I, I urge people to remember, I know a lot of people are like, well, my God, you know, we're, we're paying engineers a fortune. You have to have engineers. Um, when you don't, things work out like some of the other things in town have worked out. Um, you know, these engineers are shooting things to be able to know the level of elevation, how we need to dig the retention ponds, how we need to level everything to make sure that there's no flooding. Um, and when we're redoing these roads, they cost a fortune. And so you don't want to redo it using ill and underprepared, inadequate information and then spend a million dollars doing it and two years later have to spend another million dollars doing it. Um, one of the things I thought was hilarious at the latest League of Municipalities training when they were talking about streets and roads, uh, another city commissioner from a different city in the state asked, how do you determine when it's time to rip up the underlaying and completely redo a surface? And the league's answer to that was, um, whenever you get it repaved and then it has to be repaved the next year, probably time to go ahead and redo it. And I thought, my God, that would suck. You know, you spend one $1.5 million to redo a road and then the next year it's ruined and you've got to spend $4 million a second time around. So... I'm always err on the side of pay the engineers, get it done right the first time, have a longer-lasting project. Now, we're going to talk about Garfield 
where Garfield School used to be. I just want to preface this with just a little short explanation of anywhere you see a school, and I just assume everyone knows this, but maybe not, but uh, schools do not pay property tax. Why? Because they would have to collect your property tax to pay property tax. So schools like Makes City no Hall sense. won't pay property tax. The county buildings don't pay property tax because we as the stakeholders of community basically own them and mm -hmm. it's our property so we don't pay we don't charge ourselves to pay back to ourselves property yeah. tax and when he's saying we he means all of us that live here we you know the because community. we own the city we own the county we own the schools um, because we are the very people that fund those operations and keep them going so we own all the land that all those entities sit on so so garfield was recently torn down so now <coughs> you have an empty an empty lot basically a whole a yep. whole city block that's empty and the Playground equipment is going to go to Arcalan, and Which that will awesome. just flatten it to zero. So there was a suggestion, recommendation of maybe look at putting a park there yep. or something like that. And so there was a little discussion about that last night. Yeah, and basically um, Cal basically was asking for commission action to see if we wanted him to start talking with USD 480 about possibly acquiring the land for whatever we wanted to use it for. Um, it, it was a 2-2 two -two vote. Um, so I nominated that we go ahead and start the conversation with USD 480 because what could it hurt? Um, the city is undertaking so many projects right now that I figure we, we kind of want as much land as we can possibly get. That way we have available options for any kind of future developments. Um, Mr. Martinez seconded. However, um, Mrs. Segrist and uh, Mr. Carlisle um, voted nay. And since Ron wasn't there, it was a 2-2. Fails to go through. Which is fine. You know, to me, it's always a good thing to look at acquiring more and more land, especially because I highly doubt the school has any plans of anything to do with it. Um, if they do, I apologize. Not trying to put words in the school's mouth, but I just can't picture them having a necessary utilization or purpose for that land. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, there's 25 things I could think of to, to, that we could use it for down the line, um, even though it's not in a really ideal spot of town. Now, I will say a couple of, you know, we told the citizens, and this goes to all of you, if you come to a commission meeting, not only can you speak any items from citizens or items from groups at the beginning, but if, if you want to talk about any given agenda item as it's being discussed, raise your hand. Um, if it hasn't been voted on yet, it's still open to public discussion. Raise your hand. You'll be recognized and have a chance to chime in, which what I love last night is we had people do that on multiple things. Um, this was one of those things. And basically, you know, some of the citizens said we would like that to become a city park. Um, other citizens said we don't want to see more housing go in there because we already have enough houses available for the love of God. Let's get those moved first. Um, I know that I feel like Liberal has a lot of parks. Like we got a lot of parks. Now, keep in mind, just my opinion. Um, I utilize quite a few of those parks because I love taking my daughter and my wife and my dog and out and abroad and having fun. Um, but I just felt like, you know, to, to put it in another park there and have the maintenance costs and have everything else that we would have to put into it, not at this point really a good idea. Um, but I do appreciate the people that chimed in on that. I think your idea was fantastic, not negating that. Um, but, you know, to me, Get all the land we can get because you never know how you're going to be able to use it down the line. And uh, there's no building liabilities like the old high school was because that's been taken care of. Building's gone. So you're just talking about dirt and, uh, and a square of it. And I know that uh, in that area of town, perhaps, and still keep this conversation open and going, but that they are a long way away from one of those parks where they are at. They either have to go to... Harrison Circle or Blue That's true. Bonnet. That's true. Uh, so the people in that part of town doesn't necessarily have easy access to a park. And uh, they used to have a playground that was right there, and they, people could go play there. <clears throat> but now that's going to be gone. So just food for thought yeah. that, you know, uh, well, and I'm it could still be it. something that could, that could be considered. Or yeah. even if the, the local community is willing to do some volunteerism around that park and maybe... Well, I'll the tell you what, down and mow it or something. I always tell people this, but, you know, we are representatives of you. So if, if you guys want to see that become a park, stay persistent, stay honest, you know, and kind of organize a group that wants to see that get done and will help us accomplish that endeavor, and it may still happen. So it, it's never a no. It's just a not right now. And uh, Jackie said, uh, where is Glix going in? Uh, Glix is going to be going in to the former Payless shoe source. That's uh, the facility Sweet. that they have. And... Uh, uh, we've we've done a story on that in the announcement, but uh, haven't seen it uh, yet. But that's where they they said that they would be going. So we'll keep an eye out, and as soon as we see some movement there, we'll let you know. And Shell um, said, "Why not put a skating rink there? I miss our skating rink we had." Like I said, you know, if we were able to get that property from USD 480, which keep in mind, some of their board members might watch last night's meeting and start the conversation themselves. 
So you never know what's going to happen. I agree, you know, because the skating park up north, I don't think worked out the way a lot of the skaters wanted it to. And it's kind of underutilized because of that. And then the one down south over there by the South Pizza Hut, just kind of his one. Other things you talking about skating park, you might clarify this for you. You're talking about skating like a skating rink, rink kind of oh. like what the one used to be out by the yeah. where the high school is now. That'd be sweet to have. And uh, of course, that would be private. You know, I don't think that they would put in a uh, say like a public uh, skating rink where it was paid for by staff from the city or something like that. The old skating rink was private. Mausers, the Mauser family, owned the old skating rink, and uh, that was my Friday night deal when my parents watched Dallas. And so as soon as the Dukes were over, we were shipped out to the uh, to the skate rink. Yep. Unfortunately, and I, and I and I would love to see it come back from a nostalgia's point of view. But would kids today? Because that's what it would take. It would take kids to support it and to go to it. And um, you know, the the cell phone seems to be a more uh, prevalent activity than maybe going skating. Unfortunately, but uh, I enjoy skating. I do. And. Uh, I, I was a regular out at the out at the skating rink, and uh, so I think right now though, if you want to go skating, I think they're taking applications at Sonic, and I think it said for a skating car hop. So if anyone wants to do that and get paid, Man, I'm go out you, there. You could not pay me to do that for the reason that I cannot balance that well. Every time I go to a skating rink, all I'm doing is testing the laws of gravity, and I always lose. Newman's owned it last. Time. Okay, okay. Gotcha. So they must have bought it from the Mauser family. The Mauser family actually lived right across the street from Garfield, and uh, they used to run it. And um, but anything like that would be great because I know that I actually hadn't been bowling since Billy's redid their airlines. That is awesome, and I love that we have that because I can't even imagine how cool it is on league nights whenever they're all full and everything in there. Uh, but I know like old school things like that, bowling alleys, skating rinks. You know that's awesome. And hopefully our youth will come back around to wanting to utilize things like that. But I agree with Earl. You know, a lot of times right now we're still trying to get a feel for this generation under me. You constantly hear people in the news say, oh, you know, millennials suck and millennials are ruining this world. Well, I'm a millennial. Um, and I can definitively tell you when we talk about a generational divide, um, the generation below me, I always consider to be the Tide Pod generation. I'm still trying to figure them out. The generations above me are still trying to get a feel for us. So it'll be interesting because, you know, I think that technology has progressed so quickly that it's been very difficult for all of us to adjust and acclimate to. Um, and the kids have done it better because they grew up with it. Um, but you would hope at some point, maybe an augmented reality skating rink, you know, where, where when you walk in, <laughs> you can put on goggles step. while you're skating and there's like mini games or something like that. We got to figure out a way to get the youth re-involved. So. And just a good word for the bowling alley. I can, every time I try to go out there, Something's always happening in yeah. there. It's busy. It's acti it, There's activity going. Yeah. Lights, music. I mean, it's fun. It's a fun <laughs> no, place to be. No, my generation didn't even have Tide Pods when we were growing up. And uh, I know when I was hearing <laughs> about that trend, it was one of those kind of like, what? <laughs> yeah, that, that seems like a good idea to put dangerous, poisonous chemicals into your body. I think it, it puts Darwin's theory into practice. <laughs> I mean, it, sometimes uh, the, the some people eliminate themselves and, and life goes on. But... Uh, one last thing on the agenda, and uh, we'll let you guys go today, but uh, the water department building purchase. Yes, indeed. So uh, there was an executive session a couple months ago about the acquiring of this property. Obviously, everything worked out to where it was, uh, it was approved. Um, so the water department will be getting a new building, and I didn't write the cost of that down. So that's fantastic. It's going to cost some money. Um, I didn't write down the exact amount of money it's going to cost, and it wasn't actually in the agenda. Um, the only other thing that happened, and keep in mind, um, this was a complete accident. There was there was absolutely no um, no malevolent meanings here. Um, but Chris Ford did come up and apologize because whenever we got our uh, our loan for the front end wheel loader a couple of meetings ago, um, we thought that the lowest bid was coming from a bank out of Colorado. Unfortunately, a bank from here in town, Bank of Beaver City, actually did submit a bid that was the lowest bid. Um, but the confusion came in the fact that their email response just said thank you, and Chris did not notice that there was an attachment on it, so we never actually got to see the bid. Um, he has since apologized to him. We've apologized to him. Once again, I apologize. We would always rather go through a local bank, especially at a better interest rate. So, you know, we'll definitely try to make sure that doesn't happen again, but thank you for everything you do, Bank of Beaver City, and definitely apologize that that situation occurred. And Jackie mentioned that the Recreation Center has outstanding programs, and they do. It's phenomenal. Uh, one of the issues with those, however, is about 5.30, closed. So if you want to do anything after 
you're not going to be able to go into the recreation center and do it. Um, they have great video games in there. They've got uh, uh, oh, pool video. tables, ping pong tables, yep. uh, air hockey. And if I lived in that neighborhood and I was a, and I was a, a young man, I'd be heading over there and playing that stuff. They'd, they'd have to kick me out. Matter of yeah. fact, that they used to have to kick me out. I just I love used how to go there a lot. That part of town is so busy. Like in the afternoons and early evenings, you know, every time that, that I take uh, Sophia and Brenna and Bowser for a walk, um, the park is always packed over there at Blue Bonnet. The recreation department, there's always people playing at the basketball uh, courts. There's always people over there at the exercise park, the soccer fields, baseball fields, all of it is always very thriving and alive. So I, I always love getting to see that. And uh, a, cu- a couple more things before we end it here. Um, we had a special meeting, like I said, with the MAM Foundation. So um, we're currently working between the City Commission and the MAM Foundation to try to come up with a long-term applicable solution to ensure that some of the bad tastes that, that the MAM Foundation has in their mouth about the way things have gone in the past can be rectified. Um, we talked about the possibility of the MAM Foundation taking over day-to-day operations and being still being funded by the city or Seward County Community College overtaking the day-to-day operations. So um, you're going to see a couple more special meetings in the upcoming weeks. Um, it's just because... We're communicating now better than we have in years. Um, the, the city's working with the county. The city's working with ma'am. The county's working with everybody. Everything's going really well. So while we're all communicating very well and working together, we want to try to hammer out as many of these long-term potential projects as possible. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to come to a very applicable solution um, between the city and the ma'am foundation about how the Air Museum will be handled in the future. Um, another special meeting that we had that I don't think we've been able to discuss on here yet was joint economic development. That was between the city and the county. Phenomenal meeting. Um, both the city and the county, all of our commissioners are very geared mentally towards let's get in industry, let's get in business, let's get in everything we can. Um, especially because if you guys think about it, the political environment here is very volatile. Um, we only have a year and a half left with the commission that we have that's working so well with everybody to try to get as much done as possible. And there's no telling what the next election cycle for the county or city may bring. So I know there is a major sense of urgency of, hey, we're all working together as good as possible. We're all on the same page. Let's get as much done as quickly as possible as we can. Um, just in case we get people that don't see the eye to eye on EcoDevo or anything like that, um, that don't want to pursue that anymore. So we can get a lot of this done before that takes place. Um, I know that what was discussed in that meeting was the possibility of making joint economic development its own nonprofit corporate entity and having it being funded from the city, the county, the school district, the college, and the hospital, having a board appointed to it, and having them have their own employees with full authority to be able to issue out any abatements, any IRBs, um, anything necessary to bring in industry. There's other communities, quite a few actually, that have this kind of setup, and it seems to work out very well for them. Um, so I don't know if that's going to be the absolute solution, but I do know that that is being heavily discussed. We actually have another meeting with them this Friday, so you guys will be able to hear more about that. I'm sure Earl will uh, have that covered, and we'll be able to get more coverage out to everybody on that. Um, only other thing that was discussed at that was comprehensive plans. Those things cost an absolute fortune, and basically you're trying to set out your, your city and your county's goals for 5 years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Well, what we discussed is, instead of paying $150,000 each to have somebody from outside the community that doesn't even know us draft those up, we could go and do them together and save a fortune of money and have a joint vision for the city and county. Keep in mind, the reason that you're going to start hearing a lot of these joint projects, there's only two cities in Seward County. you got Liberal and Kismet. So it makes sense in all of our minds to, to start working a lot more closely together and combining and joining in on a lot of projects together to save money and because we all have the same goal. We want Seward County to succeed. We want Liberal to succeed. We want Kismet to succeed. So we'll keep you guys posted on all of the updates from all of these special meetings that we've been having. Um, feel free to join us at any of them. I think the next one is Friday at 5 o'clock at Seward County Administration Building upstairs. And feel free to comment on here. Mm-hmm. Let us know any other questions you may have, and we'll see if Taylor can get us some answers, and uh, uh, we'll help out if we can. And uh, keep watching. And uh, I actually did record this, so it will be on YouTube as well today. So uh, we'll have it on Facebook, YouTube. And if you have anything you'd like us to, to ask Taylor next time, uh, send us uh, a Facebook message. Uh, email us earl at, at liberalfirst.com. Uh, get a hold of Taylor. Yep. Either way, uh, we, we'll, we'll make sure that this is working for you. We do this so that you can know what's going on with your government and what decisions are making. It's right here. It's Indeed. all out in the open. And uh, so we want it to work for you. Absolutely. Uh, So, this Earl, Taylor. Thank you very much, and thank you to everyone who watched and joined in. We'll see you real soon. It's going to work. There we go.